This week on Vaticano, discover the story of the oldest religious hospitality order in the world. These knights were protecting Christians in the Holy Land in the past and are now saving the lives of thousands of people worldwide. Take an exclusive look inside the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of Malta. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Rome, the Aventine, one of the seven legendary hills on which the Eternal City was born. Today it's a peaceful island amongst busy districts of Rome, the perfect place to pray in ancient churches and to hide from the harsh summer sun in the Orange Garden. However, tourists also come to this area for another special reason. Every day people line up here in front of this uninviting big door and its small keyhole to take a peek. It sounds unbelievable, but through this tiny keyhole, you can see three sovereign states, the Vatican with St. Peter's in the background, the Order of Malta with the garden in the foreground, and Italy, which is basically everything else between the cupola and the garden. The keyhole is part of the so-called Magistral Villa, the extraterritorial property of one of the oldest orders of knights in the Catholic Church, the Hospitallers of Jerusalem, better known as the Order of Malta. Inside these rooms, the Grand Master receives important guests and holds high-level meetings. These corridors have seen the last six Grand Masters of the Order since this palace became the official home of the Order in 1834. However, the real treasure of the villa is the Church of St. Mary on the Aventine, renovated in the 18th century by the famous Italian architect Gian Battista Piranesi. The architectural motifs of the decorations evoke the symbolic nature of the knights. The main altar is dedicated to St. Basil, one of the protectors of the order. The entire complex has the shape of a big ship holding the globe, with St. Basil lifting it up to heaven. This church hosts the most significant events in the order's institutional and spiritual life. For instance, it is here that the most recent Grand Masters have all been appointed. To discover the origins of this venerable order of knights of the Catholic Church, we met with a member of its elected government, Fra John Chrétien. The correct name of the order is Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John, and I shan't take that into consideration, of Jerusalem, of Rhodes, and of Malta. These are the three main stepping stones in our history. Of Jerusalem, because the order was founded in Jerusalem before the First Crusade. As a hospitaller order, assisting pilgrims going to the Holy Land. It became necessary very soon to take up arms to defend the hospitals of the order. So the order wasn't born as a military order, it was born as a hospitaller religious order. When Christendom lost Jerusalem, the order conquered the island of Rhodes and moved there. During this time, the order intensified its military mission, especially its naval forces. With the loss of Rhodes in 1522, in 1522, Suleiman the Magnificent took the island of Rhodes and expelled the order. The order had to look for a new seat, and it took the order eight years to find the new seat. Finally, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, who was also King of Sicily, and Malta at that time was part of the Kingdom of Sicily, donated the island of Malta to the order as its new seat in the Mediterranean. So that completes the three names we've mentioned, of Jerusalem, of Rhodes, and of Malta. The order established itself on the island of Malta in 1530. And from there, it carried out its hospital and military activities all over Europe. About two and a half centuries later, in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte invaded the island, and as the order was forbidden from taking up arms against fellow Christians, the knights had to leave the island. The expelled knights found shelter under the protection of the Russian Emperor Paul I in St. Petersburg. Five years later, they moved to Sicily, then to Ferrara, and then finally to Rome. 
So this period of unrest, this period of moving around, waiting to establish itself somewhere, lasted 36 years, from 1798 to 1834. In 1834, we established its ourselves in this palace, which had belonged to the order for about a century and a half already, and which had been our embassy to the Holy See when we were on the island of Malta, and we are still here. These days, the Order of Malta has gone back to its main humanitarian mission. Its members count at about 13,000, as well as approximately 80,000 trained volunteers who work to care for the sick and help the poor worldwide. This is the seat of the government of the Sovereign Order of Malta. The Palazzo Malta, or Magistral Palace, is situated in the historical center of Rome on Via dei Condotti. A stone's throw away from a world-renowned tourist attraction, the Spanish Steps. At the main entrance of the palace, there are three flags. One is the flag of St. John, in the middle is the personal flag of the Grand Master, and the third is the flag of the Order's Hospitaller Works. It was Fra Antonio Bosio who donated the palace to the Order in 1629. He was a professed knight, scholar, and Christian archaeologist. So when the order arrived in Rome in 1834, the palace became the Grand Master's residence and the seat of government. The internal organization of the Sovereign Order of Malta is a combination and structure of a state government and a religious order. Today the order does not possess any territory since the loss of the island of Malta. The island of Malta is an independent country and the order of Malta is a sovereign religious order. Well, it's very important because it really means independent of any foreign interference. The order has been sovereign, supranational, not connected with any national power, completely independent, answering only to the Holy Father for religious matters, not for political matters, since its foundation. The head of the order is both the sovereign and the spiritual superior. The Grand Master is a professed knight who has taken the vows of obedience, chastity and poverty. Once he is elected, he remains in office for life. The Grand Master is assisted by the Sovereign Council, elected for a term of five years by the General Chapter. This is made up of the Grand Commander, the Grand Chancellor, the Grand Hospitaller, the Receiver of the Common Treasure and another six members. The Constitution and the Code of the Order of Malta are the sources of its institutional life and activities. Together with the Magistral Villa, the Magistral Palace is the beating heart of the institutional life of the Knights. Imagine the entire apparatus of state, with its ministers, an embassy, a hospital, and the religious supreme, all of these placed only in two buildings. These two institutional sees have been granted extraterritorial rights by the Italian Republic. From this central hub, the Knights oversee their diplomatic, religious, and humanitarian activities. The Order of Malta has full diplomatic relations with 106 countries and has been recognized by each of them as the independent headquarters of a sovereign entity. The Knights of the Order of Malta have a long military tradition. They have fought battles, led military campaigns and crusades. They also took part in the historic Battle of Lepanto, when the Christian League stopped any further military expansion of the Ottomans into Europe. 
However, when the Knights lost the island of Malta, their military purpose ceased as well. Today, the order has turned back to its first humanitarian vocation while preserving its old military traditions. To find out more about the charitable activities of the order, we went to the House of the Knights of Rhodes in the center of Rome. This house hosts the Italian Relief Corps of the Order of Malta and is the central seat of the Italian Division of the Knights. Before we learn about the rescue activities of the order, let's explore the house, which was the ancient seat of the Roman Priorate of the Knights of Malta, and which certainly deserves a special look. Built in the 13th century, it covers a part of the Roman Forum and the Basilian Monastery. Walking into the building, you have the impression that time here has stood still. And the building can reveal its 2,000 years of history. This is the Hall of Honor, with a beautiful wooden ceiling and frescoes along the walls. These are the maps of the islands that used to belong to the order. These eight flags represent the eight official languages of the order. Spanish, Italian, English, German, Portuguese, and three dialects of French. The number eight is of special symbolic importance for the order. Eight are the tips of the Maltese cross, and eight are the Beatitudes pronounced by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Hall of Loggia is a 16th century fireplace, and on the opposite wall, the remains of the Forum of Augustus, a head of Jupiter Ammon, flanked by two caryatids and some blocks of the original marble wall. On the same floor is also the Byzantine Hall, which houses the 13th century frescoes from the now lost Church of St. Basil. Going down the stairs built at the time of the ancient Romans, we reach the underground level of the house. This chapel is dedicated to St. John the Baptist, the patron saint of the Order of Malta. Leaving the historical halls and loggias, we find the modern offices of the Italian Relief Corps and the Order of Malta. Mauro Casingini is the head of this department. He says that the biggest concern for now is the situation in the Mediterranean Basin. When we speak about our activity in the Mediterranean Sea, then we speak mostly about five sanitary teams, which are dedicated to the guard boats departing from Lampedusa and to the main boats of the Coast Guard. These are bigger boats, about 90 meters long. Then we also dedicate one doctor to the Coast Guard helicopters, which are based in Catania and which take medical personnel to where they are needed, be it directly on the boats used by migrants or on the motor boats of the Coast Guard, which intervene there, mainly in areas that Lampedusa doesn't cover. So basically, the influx of people from the Eastern Mediterranean. Currently, the order assists the Syrian refugees who are fleeing the conflict into neighboring countries. We work on a boat of the Maltese NGO MOAS, Migrant Offshore Aid Station, and we have our sanitary team on board to face the tremendous influx of migrants, most of all Syrians, who through Turkey try to reach Greece to then obviously proceed to other European countries. It is a work that has produced great results in terms of the lives we have saved. Fortunately, this influx has drastically decreased at the moment, but it's picking up again from North Africa and from Libya. So, while in one area there are fewer migrants, in other areas their number is increasing. In addition to this, the Italian Relief Corps participates in rescue operations in the entire Mediterranean basin, where other forces of law and order provide refugees with emergency aid. The Order of Malta, through its national associations and its Relief Corps, has a very impressive network. Just think about what the Lebanese Association is doing now to welcome Syrian refugees into the country. 
we know that Syrian refugees in Lebanon are about half of the total population. So, the Lebanese Association of the Order of Malta, together with Maltese International, our organization that deals with emergencies all over the world, is providing sanitary, hygienic, as well as alimentary assistance to these huge groups of people, who generally all come together at the borders of countries at war. Uh, in, um, in guerra. The Italian Relief Corps of the Order of Malta was founded in 1970. For more than 40 years now, the Knights and volunteers have helped all those who found themselves in difficult situations. And have worked side by side with military personnel to save the lives of thousands of people. The Order of Malta is the oldest existing Hospitaller Order in the world. The Knights started their medical activities at the very foundation of the Order in 12th century Jerusalem. Today the Order is spread across 120 countries where it manages about 20 hospitals and several hundred medical centers. This is one of the hospitals of the Order of Malta dedicated to their patron saint, John the Baptist. It's located in the central part of Rome, in an area called Maliana. The building looks like a medieval fortress, which would perfectly fit into the chivalrous style of the order. In reality, however, it used to be a summer residence to the popes. The director of the hospital, Pietro Scanzano, explained to us how this former papal residence became a health center. We do have here a very special building with a very interesting history. This land was all marshes in the past. There were many migratory birds and it was used as hunting grounds. It was very easy to hunt here. And so Pope Julius II had this castle built, the castle of the Maliana, and he used it as his hunting lodge. The Pope would also often come here to rest. After the dissolution of the Papal States, the castle fell into disuse, and after some decades of neglect, in 1957, the Italian government entrusted the building to the Order of Malta. This is not just a hospital, it's a special place where people get a second chance at life. Together with her colleagues, Maria Antonietta Sergio does everything she can for patient's rehabilitation and eventual return to a normal life. Neurological rehabilitation is the main focus of this hospital. Our ward, in particular, deals with patients coming from wards where serious conditions are treated, like intensive care and neurosurgery. So they typically show serious injuries, both neurological, such as hemorrhages and ischemia, and also from accidents. A lot of patients arrive here in serious health condition, some of them even in a vegetative state. The aim of the rehabilitation center is to stabilize their health and guide them to a full rehabilitation. There is motor rehabilitation, speech therapy, and cognitive rehabilitation too. We constantly stimulate our patients by talking to them. We do this either through mobilization or through gestures. In any part of the nursing process, rehabilitation included. It's all, anyway, about talking constantly to them and trying to find a way to get through to them. And sometimes we are successful in this. For instance, when they learn to communicate through their eyes, closing and opening them, or other gestures, too. Besides these beds here, we have others where we rehabilitate patients who have suffered strokes, ischemia in the brain, a fracture of the femur, or have other fractured limbs. We have here 240 beds, and the activities we provide to develop motor skills in patients are really important, 
and make this hospital the reference point in this sector in Rome. Che fa di questo un centro di riferimento in questo settore di Roma. Families play a vital role in the recovery of the patients. Ci occupiamo anche in maniera molto importante delle We take great care of the families. They're the most important form of caregivers. And in any case, the family must be supported, must be walked through every step of the medical process, and sometimes must also be consoled. In all of the hospitals of the Order of Malta, the staff follows the motto of the Order, nurturing, witnessing and protecting the faith, and serving the poor and the sick. In all their patients, the Knights recognize the suffering Christ, so every person is special and unique. When they leave our ward, most of our patients leave with a feeling of great affection towards us. For most of them, it is indeed a second life we've given them, like being reborn. Membership in the Order of Malta was traditionally a privilege of the aristocracy. This rule was enforced until 1990, when a way was created for knights and dames of the lowest classes to be elevated to the highest levels of the order. Today, the majority of members are welcome to the order without any noble lineage. The main criteria are instead the candidate's merits towards the church and the order itself. We are, first and foremost, a religious order. Some of us are committed by taking the vows which are common to all other religious orders, poverty, chastity and obedience. Others are not committed in this way. They're only committed to practice their faith as Roman Catholics and to lead an exemplary life which may serve as an example to others. Knights and dames are divided into three classes and subdivided further into different categories. Let's explore the internal division of the order class by class. The knights of the first class have only one category. They are knights of justice or professed knights and the professed conventual chaplains. These men take the religious vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. They are religious according to canon law but are not obliged to live in a community. There are also nuns of the order who belong to this category. The first class is the highest class. So the Grand Master, the Grand Commander, the Grand Prior, and the members of the governing office of the order are all elected from the male branch of the professed knights. Members of the second class are the knights and dames in obedience. They make a promise of obedience rather than a vow. This class is subdivided into three categories, knights and dames of honor and devotion in obedience, knights and dames of grace and devotion in obedience, knights and dames of magistral grace in obedience, the knights belonging to this second class can hold the positions of high officers, priors, vicars, lieutenants, procurators, regents, and chancellors of priories. The third class of knights and dames is divided into six categories. Knights and dames of honor and devotion, conventual chaplains ad honorum, knights and dames of grace and devotion, magistral chaplains, knights and dames of magistral grace, donuts of devotion, division or subdivision in the order is rather complicated but I think the main division is religious members of the order and secular members of the order all members of the same order all practicing Roman Catholics some who have taken religious vows others who have not taken religious vows or have, who have taken another vow of matrimony for example and have married and formed a family, but still active in the order, and what would we be without them? The most common class in the order is the third in the category of knights and dames of magistral grace, while the least common is certainly that of professed knights. Of these, only about 100 are in the whole world. I've never regretted taking vows in the order and never regretted having joined the order ten years before that. It has given me a lot, I have given it a lot as well, but I think it has worked very well.
Members of the Order of Malta emphasize the concept of nobility in its deepest sense. It means carrying more responsibility than others. It's not so much about costumes, aristocrats, and wealth as it is about the nobility of heart and the ability to serve others. Thank you.